Welcome everybody to the first annual general meeting of the Data Visualization Society. Uh, this is an exciting milestone for our community and for this organization. Uh, happy to see that uh, we're already getting comments and we're already seeing people in the live stream. We're gonna take about five minutes to let people sort of join in before we get started on the actual on the actual content of this of this presentation. We've got a lot of stuff planned for folks. And it's my hope that as we move forward as an organization that we can develop some some <laughs> goals and some and so and celebrate the the successes that we've had with an eye toward the future. I can already see that folks are joining from all over the world. This is great. We see folks from Canada, and we see folks from Europe, and we see folks from Virginia and everything. It's good to see the comments in the YouTube chat. We also have on the Slack an area for comments for the particular sections that we're going to be getting into. We have the board getting ready for their presentations, and we have uh, important agenda items that we have to deal with, such as the slate for new board members. And we'll get into that in detail. So in a couple of minutes, we'll get started with the presentation. And we hope everybody's just as excited as we are to be here. If you have any uh, thoughts or, rem or, or comments, um, I'd suggest you use the Slack for the individual presentations. We're going to post Slack comments for each of the individual presentations so that you can respond to the issues and provide feedback for what we've talked about today. This presentation will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel along with some of our other excellent comments. Now, obviously, we're doing a, uh, an online meeting, and so we know that there will occasionally be technical hiccups, but hopefully everything will run just as smoothly as, as it can. And as usual, um, if you have any feedback, if you have any thoughts, please feel free to reach out to us either during this presentation or later via the Slack, via email, or any other mechanism you want to use to, to get a hold of anyone. The Data Visualization Society was, was founded almost two years ago. And so to go from that point to this annual general meeting with our thousands of members, hopefully many of them will have the opportunity to join in and give their thoughts on this. It's just such an exciting time. I'm so proud and, and, and excited to be here. So we can we can get started. It's it's I think we've given enough time for folks to to come in. Um, we can switch to the next slide. Wonderful. Bear with us, it's not just the Data Visualization Society's first annual general meeting, it's all of our first annual general meeting. So like I said, there might be, there might be technical details. Um, technical issues. Can we switch to the next slide? Hey Elijah, I'm working on behind the scenes on switching up to the next slide, but if you wanna chat about our membership growth that we've had over the course of the past year, um, that would be great and give an introduction to where we're going today. Excellent. So <clears throat> we're at 17,000 members now. We've, we've seen, um, I believe, 6,000 members join in the last year from across the world. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the operational issues that we need to uh, deal with as a 501c3, which became official in August and allows us to enable it allows us to approach uh, new possibilities for partnerships and for financial support. And that's something we're going to get into in the presentations from the operations director from Amanda, who you just heard from. We're gonna talk about each of the individual directors and the roles that they've played in trying to develop the data visualization society. And most importantly, we're going to talk about the, the excellent work, not only that our directors have done, but that our members have done. 
I don't want to get into too much detail about how the Data Visualization Society sort of came about and what our long-term goals are. We have presentations slated for each of those individual uh, topics. But what I did want to talk about was just how exciting this organization's growth and its achievements have been. 17,000 members spread across the world for something that was an idea that, that, that we knew that there was a need for is such an exciting and such, a, such an amazing um, validation of what we thought was, was the, the role of this organization, what we thought this organization could do. We've got a lot of wins and we've got a lot of, of possibilities for the future. And that's what I wanna challenge members to think about as we hear from the different directors and we hear from what the Data Visualization Society has accomplished is how you as members can contribute as we move forward and what direction we should take this organization in. We've obviously got some wonderful wins. I think the biggest highlights of what we've done are our publication, Nightingale, which you'll hear about from Jason Forrest, who's the publications director, and our upcoming conference that Molly's our events director, has done an excellent job of putting together. And together, I'm hoping that we can move forward and do even more. Uh, and I really want us to think about just how the world is changing and with it, how data visualization is changing and how we can become a, a stronger and more effective organization as we transition from this sort of scrappy startup mentality and move toward a mature organization that can develop partnerships with existing practitioners and existing organizations that have been doing great work with data visualization. Our board of directors, as some of you might know, consists of myself, the executive director of the Data Visualization Society, ending my term today. Amy Cecil, our community director, Molly Pettit, our events director, Jason Forrest, our publications director, Julia Krolik, our partnerships director, Amanda McCulloch, the ops director, Neil Richard, our knowledge director, Bill Shander, our communications director, and Kuhu Gupta and Sarah Schottler, our two early career directors. We've been supported by an amazing advisory council. You can see all their names up on the slide here. Just luminaries in the field who've given us amazing advice and, and, and priceless support in trying to direct the Data Visualization Society to address the most important topics in our field and in our community. So before we get started with the annual general meeting, I wanna remind folks of the mission of the Data Visualization Society, which I think we've done so far a, a pretty good job of addressing. We try to collect and establish best practices. And by that, what, what we mean is that we, as a community, have developed a lot of amazing approaches to data visualization, but they've been a bit uh, rough and they haven't necessarily influenced each other. And so if we can gather together the different professions and the different approaches and the different audiences that we all have to deal with in our day-to-day -day work, we can try to identify themes within those similarities to better the work that we're doing, but more importantly, to record it, to reify it, and to establish these best practices in a way that hasn't necessarily been done for our, our community and our profession and our field. What we need to do is we need to develop tracks to help early career professionals and mid-career professionals to understand how they can best succeed in this still young field. And to that end, we've tried to build a board and establish structures within the Data Visualization Society that can best support those goals. We have to also recognize that data visualization isn't just an esoteric professional practice. It isn't just business intelligence or data journalism. We have to recognize that data visualization has become more and more a part of everyday life. We've seen that in 2020, we've seen that with politics and especially with the pandemic, that data visualization inflects every aspect of our day-to-day -day life. And we need to keep that in mind as we move forward with, the, with how we develop this organization 
and how we build up our uh, structures and resources to support our members. So what is an annual general meeting? Well, an annual general meeting can happen in the context of a for-profit company, but in our case is a 501c3. We're required to tell all of you just what we've been doing this year. And that doesn't just mean the sort of ideas that we've had or the accomplishments that we've done. It also means that we have to put together uh, our financial statements and let you know what kind of money we've managed to, to uh, get and how we've used those financial resources to improve and, and uh, achieve our goals. So along with explaining to you what we've been doing for this last, for this last uh, year, we also have to determine who is going to lead the Data Visualization Society moving forward. So a number of our directors, their terms are ending. We have a slate of highly qualified candidates for the next, uh, for the, for the next two years. And we will need to explain to you who those candidates are and why they're qualified and have you vote on that slate to confirm that they'll be that they'll hold those positions for the next year. So what do you do? Well, you have to hear about these updates, as the slide indicates. You have to give us feedback on what we've prioritized. You have to provide us with critique and push back when you think that we're not headed in the right direction, and support and reinforcement when you think we are. And then finally, and most importantly, you have to vote on the slate of candidates for the open board roles. These links are available to you. We've, we've emailed them to our membership, and they're also available on the Slack. If for some reason you don't feel like you have access to that, to that vote, please feel free to contact us, and we will make sure to get that to you. So coming up, that, that's, that's fine, Amanda. We can move to the agenda. So coming up, we're going to hear from the founders. We're going to talk a little bit in retrospective about how we founded the Data Visualization Society, uh, why and what we were hoping it would accomplish, and how that compares to where it is now. And then after that, we'll hear from each individual director who will give a report on their particular role and what they've accomplished and what they are hoping to see in the future. After that, Neil Richards, who has uh, run the nominations committee and put an enormous amount of work into that, will talk about our nominations for our slate of, of new directors. And then we'll give some closing remarks and hopefully we'll have, we'll have accomplished the goal of explaining to you just, just what we've done with the Data Visualization Society and where we're seeing it go. So with that in mind, I want to move to the to the discussion with my fellow founders, Molly Pettit and Amy Cecil, who all three of us um, started to talk about this idea. Like I said, uh, two years ago at Tapestry Conference in 2018 in December. And to start that out, I'd like to hear from Amy Cecil. Hi, so I'm Amy Cecil. Um, I am one of the co-founders of the Data Visualization Society along with Elijah Meeks and Molly Pettit. And I wanna give you some history about the founding of the society. Personally, I started my career as a graphic designer and designers in the US have a well-established professional association that I found invaluable as I got my start. Uh, for me, it was a resource for networking, finding jobs and portfolio reviews from real world prof professionals. They run an annual salary survey that helped me confidently ask for a raise. And I found my people again through local chapters when I moved to a new city. Data visualization conferences has, have always felt like a tiny moment of that community, but for data visualizers who often come from a variety of different professional backgrounds. Conferences are a couple of glorious days of being surrounded by the people similarly passionate about this vibrant niche thing, visualized data. Tapestry conference at the end of 2018 satisfied my thirst for this community. But after it was over, I looked around and felt lost with another data visualization conference or event on my calendar for the foreseeable future. Uh, which is why I was inspired by Elijah Meeks's third wave 
data visualization talk at Tapestry and started thinking about a place to com continue that community that I missed. I wanted to build a place that I wish I had when I was just starting out doing data visualization, a place to find other people and a common place for resources. I hope Data Visualization Society is a place of connection for people to find community and that support. And so here we are almost two years later holding our first annual general meeting, formally electing our first board. And I think we are well on our way to achieving that place of community. Elijah, do you want to talk? Thank you, Amy. So when I came to Tapestry uh, two years ago, I'd been in data visualization for nearly a decade. I worked in academia, I'd worked in professional life uh, at Netflix at the time. And what I had seen was this incredible vibrancy of community, but also simultaneously an incredible lack of structure. And what I had been writing about for the for almost a you know, for a couple of years leading up to Tapestry was how that lack of structure was adversely affecting early career professionals who were trying to find their way in data visualization. And that was most important to me. I saw engineers and designers who felt like they didn't know how to evaluate how they were doing data visualization. It was hard to tell how to do well and how to succeed at data visualization. And folks would often reach out to me and say, Elijah, how do I end up where you are? How do I end up as a data visualization engineer or a data visualization designer or a data visualization developer? And it was hard for me to answer that question other than to say, be stubborn and egotistical enough to think that you could just make up your own career. And that's not good advice for folks. We don't want a profession that's defined by people being stubborn. We want a profession that's defined by people being good at data visualization. And so it's funny because we always tell the story about how the Data Visualization Society, the idea behind it, came about. And that story has something to do with my third wave data visualization talk, which I'm quite proud of, but really was focused much more on the convergence of tools and audiences and practitioners and had only one slide at the very end, along with a few other slides. And that one slide said, we should develop structures and build a professional organization. And so oftentimes when we talk about DVS, it makes it sound like the third wave data visualization talk was to call for just such an organization as the DVS has become. But really it was an afterthought in that presentation. And it never would have came about if Amy Cecil hadn't come up to me afterward and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's actually do this and build a professional society. So we worked at that and in doing so envisioned something that we, I think in our, in our wildest dreams would be a 10th of what the data visualization society could accomplish. And I think uh, we want to, to switch to Molly so she can talk a bit about those early days. Hey, hey, yeah. So first of all, I just want to tell you kind of like how it started for me. So it all started with a conversation with Amy over drinks, I think, after like talks the last day of tapestry. Um, and I was just really immediately excited about the idea. I mirror a lot of Amy's um, kind of reasons for being excited. I remember what it was like starting out and not really knowing how to get started and where to find information and not having like a community to join for connections and for answers. And it's a thing I wish existed. And I tend to have this mentality of like, if there's a thing I wish existed, why not try to help create it? Um, so yeah, I decided to try to, to help create it. Um, so what actually happened next? So really it started out with some Google Docs of ideas. Uh, and when it came to launch, Amy, Elijah and I purposely kept it like really scrappy and there are specific, there's reasons for that. So we weren't really sure if there was a need. Um, we weren't sure if it was a thing that the disparate uh, communities of data visualization wanted. And then if it was a thing that they wanted, then what exactly would they want it to look like, right? So we felt that starting agile and scrappy like that, um, by doing that, we could build up based on the needs of the community, which is what we've been trying to do our, our best to do. Um, 
we quickly found that uh, not only, like we weren't the only ones that felt this way, and um, there were others that really wanted the central community to exist. So DVS had over 2,000 members by the end of the first week, and now we're up to se over 17,000. So uh, back kind of to the beginning, um, we soon started building up a board and structure. And I'm aware that there's people who wishes, you know, DVS is still in this kind of scrappy stage forever. And I totally, I totally get that. But a huge benefit of having the structure and having a board is longevity. Um, so now it doesn't depend on any one person continuing to contribute. For example, Elijah is stepping down and no offense, Elijah, but we'll be fine without you. Um, but that's something to celebrate, right? That's something to celebrate because we have the structure in place to make sure that uh, the build can be void, uh, the void that any person might leave can be filled. Um, so additionally, when directors leave, it also creates an opportunity for new folks to step up and get involved and to infuse fresh ideas. So I do think it's important though that we don't totally lose this scrappiness. We need to keep listening to the membership and folks in the data viz community to understand what's needed. We need to keep iterating. We need to constantly acknowledge that we're not perfect and that we can do better. And we need to push to make the improvements necessary and we need to be transparent as we do it. Um, so anyway, uh, enough for me. I, I think that without further ado, we're going to move into the director updates um, so that everyone can tell you about what we've been up to. So yeah, Amy, take it away. Thanks, Molly. Um, so I've held the community director role for the past year. Um, one of the largest and most important initiatives was to rework and run the annual census for data visualization professionals for 2020. So this survey was started in 2017 by Elijah Meeks and the Data Visualization Society has adopted it and formalized it and changed it a bunch of times. Um, so this year we included uh, input from the community. We added branching so that different types of professionals each answered a tailored set of questions and the results from the survey are cleaned and released to the public. So we're still collecting feedback on this year's survey to rework it again for next year because of this continuous iteration and improvement. The Data Visualization 2020 Census also served as the data source for our latest challenge, where we invited communities to dig into the data. There were 30 entries that are currently being judged. Since the start of the society, we've run seven other challenges and have partnered with organizations like Black and Data and understanding uh, risk to provide opportunities for visualizers to practice their skills and highlight their abilities. In response to COVID, we began new programming to provide community while people were stuck at home. Over the past nine months, we've hosted a series of fireside chats and these chats are intended to be conversational in nature and to highlight people who might not normally be the loudest voices. So over the last five, eight fireside chats, we featured 26 panelists, 26 panelists and had hundreds of people attend the live events. The recordings are on the DVF YouTube channel, so you can watch them all there. And we've accumulated almost 8,000 YouTube views on these chats. We expect to continue this programming in 2021 with discussions on topics like the 2020 US election visualizations, real world business dashboards, and other conversations about the accessibility of data visualization. This year, we also launched the Buddies program. This resource facilitates self-directed peer mentoring where data visualization professionals find and pair with someone who wants to share their skills. The program has had over 250 people who have signed up to participate, and you can also sign up. The participation instructions are on our website under programs. There are several programs for which we've done the planning and live work but they've been delayed, the launch has been delayed because of COVID. So we're prepared to move forward with these as conditions approve, improve. Uh, working with Kuhu, who is one of the early career directors, we developed a program for local groups to become affiliated with the Data Visualization Society. Last March, we launched the program and the pilot for it, like really bad timing for a local initiative. Uh, 
So it was right as COVID hit the U.S. and the program is currently on hold until more countries can safely gather. We've also researched and outlined a formal mentorship program, which is delayed. In the first iteration of this program, we're gonna run a three month program where a mentor who has five plus years of experience is paired directly with a mentee with less experience. Each pair will be put in a small group with other pairs who are looking for similar skills. The size of the program is, will depend on how many applicants we receive for both mentees and mentors. So I'm excited to start these new programs and continue to run other programs if I'm confirmed for the 2021 board. I'm now gonna hand it off to the events director, Molly. Hello everyone, me again. Uh, promise you'll hear from more than just Elijah, Amy and I. Um, so yeah, I am gonna tell you a bit about what we've been up to in events. And as I'm sure a lot of you can guess, the major thing that I've been focusing on this past year is Outlier, which is a virtual conference that we're hosting next month, coming up very soon. Um, so the goals of Outlier uh, are really to create this environment that encourages attendees to make connections with other people, to learn from others, and to inspire others with your own experiences and expertise. So all the while uh, keeping accessibility and inclusion at the heart of our decisions. So how did we go about doing this? A um, few things, uh, we made sure to do a public call for speakers. This felt important uh, to ensure that everybody had the opportunity to apply. We also wanted to encourage first time speakers uh, and we set up a mentorship program for this. So. Um, we selected seasoned speakers as well as less experienced speakers, and we gave everyone the opportunity to sign up to be a mentor or a mentee. So this is to help new speakers feel more comfortable as they share their expertise. And additionally, uh, we, are, uh, we focused on reaching out across geographies and encouraging speakers to present in any language. Um, so we translated this into 18 different languages and we shared the link in the DataViz communities across the world. Next, and then we can go to the next one. Okay, so um, additionally, we are scheduling talks nearly around the clock. Uh, no matter where you live, we want you to be able to enjoy a day's worth of conference during uh, your waking hours. So that's why right now uh, we're planning for about a 21 hour days with talks, discussions and activities spread throughout. Um, additionally, from the beginning, we didn't wanna be limited to a typical or standard conference structure. And so we wanted to utilize the freedoms that really in a, a virtual event provides um, to create something that we thought would best serve the goals uh, for the attendees. So um, we're gonna do kind of this, uh, two kind of sections throughout the conference, this curated section and open section. So the curated sections will look very similar to a standard conference structure with a higher focus on talks um, and the speakers that you can see uh, on the website. The open sections will consist of kind of unconference style sessions um, and we'll have several things happening concurrently to be fleshed out based on the interest of the attendees. So uh, that's a perfect segue to talk about more a bit about these opportunities for attendees to present. Uh, we wanted to provide more opportunities uh, for us to shine light on more people and for people to showcase, uh, you know, things that they've been working on or discuss things that they care about with other attendees. So with these unconference style sessions, all attendees will have the opportunity to create one. Uh, some examples are additional talks, panels, discussions, Q and A's, uh, games, really it could, it could be anything. <laughs> um, and this allows flexibility for sessions that are created by and for the attendees. Additionally, um, we also uh, have spots uh, for lightning talks um, and because we wanna, again, just be able to showcase more. So these will be five minute talks uh, grouped together in sections across the three days. You can find out more, uh, there's, these two articles exist on, uh, they're on the Outlier website, they're on Nightingale, and they're on Twitter. Uh, additionally, we felt it important to create a pricing structure that is accessible. Uh, a few reasons for this. 
One, uh, we wanted to reach a global audience and it's simply not realistic to assume that the same pricing will work worldwide. It's just not. Uh, additionally, the pandemic has created a rough year for a lot of people and creating an environment where some, this creates an environment where some are simply less able to justify expenses like this, but still want to be able to learn. And we wanna make sure that students are also able to attend. So uh, to create a great event, one needs money. We've already got some really great sponsors and we're still accepting more. So having sponsors allows us to pay, it allows us to pay our speakers. Uh, it, they also um, allow to, for us to pay for things like translations and captioning services and tech platforms that allow networking con and connections across attendees. Uh, they also allow us to provide the sliding scale of ticket prices that I just mentioned, including free tickets, making the event more open and inclusive. So if you're interested, reach out my email was on the slide. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then looking forward, I think there's a lot of brainstorming to be done about what's next. And honestly, my goal is just to get through Outlier in February right now. Um, in the long term, the plan is to do another rendition of Outlier in 2022. Another big goal is just between now and then to really learn from this year's offense, understand what could be better, create a blueprint for next year and like flesh out the documentation. So our process is just like real smooth the second time around. Um, besides that, I think there's a lot of room to start thinking about what else, but after outlier, get one thing at a time. So um, lastly, I'd like to do a really quick shout out to the events committee. Creating an event like this takes so many man, man hours, it's so much work. An outlier would absolutely not be possible without the help and support I've gotten from these amazing people. So thank you to everyone on the committee. Seriously, thank you. Uh, and I'll see you at the next meeting. And uh, I'm now going to go ahead and pass the torch on to Bill, our communications director. So take it away, Bill. All right, thank you, Molly. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk about communications, but it's going to be very brief because communications is really a supportive role. Like we don't do these big, cool, interesting, amazing initiatives like Molly and Amy were describing. What we do is we work with our amazing colleagues who are doing these amazing things. And of course, we try to help tell those stories. And we do that by posting things for the public on social media and speaking to you all via Slack and email, et cetera. And we don't even do all of that as an example Molly and her team are doing all the posting pretty much for Outlier. And so we sort of support and give advice here and there, but you know, we support, that's what we do. It's a team effort as the, the funny little gift set shows. Um, now, what we are doing of course, is we do, for instance, have a couple people on our committee who post every single day to those social media channels, doing a lot, putting a lot of time in uh, to do that kind of work. And we are of course, developing communication strategies and systems and putting things in place so that over time, you know, this thing will evolve and grow as DVS evolves and grows. And as Elijah said, you know, we've been sort of a scrappy startup and trying to find our voice. Who are we? What are we doing, et cetera? And as we move into being, becoming a more mature organization, of course, that's going to happen. You know, we're going to find our voice and sort of develop those strategies. Um, to that end, one of our primary initiatives for 2021 is to put in place an analytics infrastructure for our communications because why? Hey, we believe in data. We think that maybe we can do a better job communicating with you all if we actually have analytics to track what we're doing and how it's working, et cetera. And in front of you, what you see is a you know nice chunk of high level stats for what has happened in the past year plus. You know, look at that LinkedIn number, 69,000 followers. And, you know, to be fair, also, I came into this role in, in April, I get zero credit for any of this. I mean, first of all, you know, people like Yvonne Fitzgerald and Elena Perron, who have been running some of our channels, Elijah, who started off with LinkedIn and Twitter, most of that growth is due to them. But these numbers are astounding. Uh, and they're only going up from here. So I was honored to be brought in to be communications director in April. My term is also ending, but I'm really looking forward to continuing to support and work with DVS going forward uh, in whatever capacity I possibly can. In the meantime, uh, you know, I definitely want you all to follow us on social media at, at uh, Data Viz Society and definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel. We could use a few more subscriptions there to help us leverage some of the power you get when you get more subscribers 
uh, on YouTube. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna throw it over to Jason, who's gonna talk about publications. Oh, Jason, we're missing out on some of your great content. So I think you might be on mute. Oh my gosh, it wouldn't be a call if I'm not on mute five times. Uh, well, there you go. I'm sure my my kid will come in in a minute and ask for something for his homework. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, I want to share some of the successes that we've had over the past year and a half. First, I want to share my realization that Nightingale is the embodiment of joy. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to publish articles for and by a community that exhibits exceptional generosity of knowledge and support. We are thrilled to organize, thrilled to find and nurture new voices, thrilled to collaborate with writers on all aspects of data viz. We are proud of our work and feel that every, val every article has value, both for the writer and our community. Our joy shines through and we feel it reflected by our audience. Our editorial staff has tried to create an environment where new voices can be nurtured to expand the discourse. Roughly one third of all our writers have published for Nightingale uh, for the first time. This represents a generation of practitioners sharing their stories, curiosity, best practices, and perspectives. That said, Nightingale takes real work. The effort by our authors and editors is tremendous. After each article is submitted, we pair them with an editor for multiple revisions. Then our manager editor, our, our managing editor Mary and Isaac before her, reread, prep each article, and schedule them for publication. So far, we've had about 20 different paid and volunteer editors working on Nightingale from around the world. A few months ago, we started a new letter, The Gale, to great success. It <laughs> features a recap of our articles plus unique content. Sign up for the Gale newsletter on any Nightingale page. In addition, we're also curating unique editorial content such as our Nightingale and Chill or Earth Week campaigns while regularly encouraging submissions. Most people are surprised uh, just how much work it is, but this is where our joy emerges in our conversations and collaboration with our community. Before we began, we wanted Nightingale to exist in a new space between an academic journal and a blog post. We crave the curious, unexpected, high quality writing that has been found in other disciplines. As editor in chief, I am proud to say that we have indeed built a new cozy niche for the field of writing about data visualization and information design, both for our DBS community and the larger discipline as a whole. Since Nightingale began, my focus uh, as editor-in-chief was to establish an operational structure from staffing editors and uh, creating an editorial pipeline to securing funding from Medium to support bo both our operation as well as the DVS as a whole. We focused on the maintainability of Nightingale as our primary goal, and in doing so, we've been able to create an ecosystem of interlocking and reinforcing support in order to amplify our passion. Lastly, this year, Nightingale will change. With the evolution of the DVS, Nightingale will also continue to evolve by exploring new publishing channels for our platform, audience, and distribution methods. Nightingale is still a small publication, and there is much more to be done to achieve our goals and ambitions. Our message is unique, welcoming, and interesting. These qualities position our community as a beacon for challenging ideas and curious minds. This year will bring some new, bold, and exciting ideas both to the DVS community and the wider audience. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Passing it over to Kuhu and Sarah. Thank you, Jason. Hi everyone, I am Kuhu Gupta. Uh, Sarah and I held a uh, general director early career position for the past year. As early career directors, we took different initiatives to support early career folks in the community. We formed a connect channel to have a dedicated space to talk about the unique challenges early career professionals face and also for us to understand what value we could bring. 
we conducted eight discussions on slack uh, on different uh, which ran for a, for a, for a month uh, on different themes like resumes portfolios interviews uh, uh, and we also did a series on data viz careers to in order to run these invited folks from the early career channel to help us moderate these discussions um, and most of these discussions were uh, were followed by a q and a session uh, by, with uh, experts from the community we recorded these uh, sessions and uploaded them on youtube and so far we have five videos up on the channel with more than 2000 views we hope these resources and conversations uh, help us anyone start their journey in data visualization now sara you can take it from here yeah um yeah, we're really proud of what we've been able to build here and offer to all the students and early career people in the last year and a half. And we've also gained a lot of valuable experience as to what will and won't work. Um, we are both leaving our roles, but we think we've laid a good foundation for the new early career director to build on this. Um, what we see for the future is further increasing the reach to students and early career professionals to make sure that everyone is aware of the various uh, DBS initiatives and programs that they can benefit from, not just what we're organizing, but also what all of the other directors are working on um, to continue fostering an early career community and getting people involved and organizing more events and initiatives and also creating resources um, to continue involving more experienced data visualization professionals in offering guidance and support to early career people like we've done with the Q&A sessions that we wrapped our discussions up with um and then for the both of both of us in addition to the early career work we did um we were also involved in lots of not early career related board work um because we were both general directors um but now the new person is going to actually be a dedicated early career director so we're excited to see um where she takes it and um yeah we look forward to passing this opportunity on to her and if you're curious, um, head over to the YouTube channel and watch some of our recorded Q&A sessions. And now we're going to pass it on to Neil, the Knowledge Director. Hi, Neil. You all ready to go ahead and get started with your section of your update? So it looks like we may have actually lost Neil, so we'll pop back to him in just a minute. If we can zoom forward just a few slides, um, Julia, can I invite you to go ahead and give the update on the on your updates as the partnerships director over the past year? Yeah, I can do that. No problem. Um, so thanks, Amanda, for handing it off. Um, my name is Julia Krolik, and I started helping with the organizational side of things, I believe in uh, late April or early May in 2019. Um, for the last little bit, I have been um, the partnerships director. And so the goal of the role really is to form strategic partnerships that benefit our membership and our organization. Um, for the last little while, the, the, the primary focus was about defining criteria um, for various partnerships, whether that's academia, companies, or other organizations. I'm gonna keep it brief and just do a couple of highlights. Um, we did partner with a couple of conferences uh, to offer our members some discounts. Uh, so DataFest Belize is one and also DataViz Live. Um, and then we partnered with an organization called Black and Data. Um, they're dedicated to amplifying black folks and informatics, data science and coding around the world. And they had um, an event in November on Twitter. And so uh, we um, help support them and provide a data visualization challenge platform for them. And so uh, keep an eye out for um, a data viz gallery coming up soon. Um, for the next slide, please. 
Thanks. So looking ahead, uh, there are a couple of initiatives I want to mention. Um, one is a data visualization society marketplace. Um, I have been aware of some of the commentary in the new channel in terms of the needs that some of our freelance members have. And so we are exploring um, ways that we can easily connect freelancers and clients um, for our members. And another place um, that we would like to turn to is data visualization accreditation. And so I won't be working alone on that. I will be working with the incoming education director on this. Um, and of course, all of you as our members uh, to establish uh, an accreditation program. So if um, if you if you folks up there want to be involved in either of these initiatives, please um, reach out and uh, and let me know. Uh, this is definitely an effort, uh, not just by people on the board or on the committees, but by um, all of you as well. And we will require your input. Um, for uh, the next slide, I want to kind of turn into something a little bit fun. Um, as of course, you all know, we have um, an amazing and engaging uh, DVS um, community on Slack. Um, and so we're going to be releasing a fun little um, app um, called Pollen. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is going to launch on uh, January 27th. Um, and the really awesome thing about uh, this visualization app is that it allows us to look at the landscape of all of our channels. And if you click on any of the channels when you visualize them, um, you're actually able to join the channel uh, right away if you don't already have it. Um, and uh, you can see a little bit about the channel and the members, um, the member number there. And uh, yeah, so it'll be a really great way to navigate um, the amazing content that we have and the amazing discussions that we have on Slack. Um, and so, like I said, that'll be launching on January 27th. Um, and in the meantime, you can join uh, our Slack community by joining the Data Visualization Society and become a part of the conversations. I'm going to hand it over to Neil again, Amanda, or to you. I'm going to go ahead and pop back in, Julia. And Neil is going to be kind and give us his updates over on Slack um, to make sure that we've got ample time to go through our nominations pieces. So thank you so much for those updates, Julia. We really appreciate them. All right, so uh, excited to give a quick update on operations. You'll see my face again when we get to the financial update at near the end of the session. So I just wanna do a couple quick updates on highlights from operations this year. Operations for DVS uh, to what Elijah opened with is really about building the infrastructure of an organization that will evolve and grow for decades. Starting out from scratch with absolutely no guiding documents or policies or anything else, is certainly an interesting place to start from. And I'm really grateful to all of the board and others who contributed over the course of the past two years. Uh, I got involved with DBS back in March when I was first uh, heading off on maternity leave with my toddler and it gave me a great little project <laughs> to work on. So uh, it's not a very exciting domain per se, but it's a very important one for our longevity as an organization. We did receive our 501c3 uh, charitable status in August of 2020. This is a big milestone for a few reasons. And if you're not someone who's interacted in the nonprofit world before, you may not be as familiar with why this is so important to us. What this does is this enables us to give tax deductible contributions uh, from donors. So when you donate to the DVS, we like other charities can give you a receipt to take that off your taxes here in the US. We can get tax exemptions at the state and federal levels. I would add that as a global organization, there are many countries that have reciprocity with 501c3 or charitable status and the equivalent in other places. So that helps us with our global reach. It creates more opportunities for partnerships and grants, and it allows us to get discounted rates for software, subscriptions, and more. So it creates a cost savings for us in the long term in terms of when we're actually purchasing different platforms. We've gotten a number of our different software platforms that we use that we'll talk about in the financial update through a vendor called TechSoup, which we were only allowed to join once we had that 501c3 certification. So I'm really proud of all the work we've done to lay that foundation this year. I'm excited to see uh, how this continues to grow and evolve as we do truly try to work towards being an even more global organization. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Neil officially this time and let him go ahead and pick up our nominations update, which I'm guessing is why a lot of you have held on through uh, the first 49 minutes of our live stream. So uh, let me go ahead, Neil, and I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Amanda. Um, I'm nervously looking around and I don't think anyone's pulled the plug, so I do apologize for, um, for, for missing out on the knowledge bit there. I've just put a couple of words on, on Slack about um, my, my time and knowledge, um, but really, 
the, the majority of this is going to be um, talking about um, the nominations and Slack process. So um, to start with, we are going onto a board of 12 people. So there's going to be a slight change to structure. Uh, we've had 11 in the past and 10 right now work because um, education is um, currently vacant. Um, but the main thing is, and we've been thinking about this over the last couple of months, um, we really want to make sure just um, we represent our, our focus for the next year a little bit more. So um, probably our biggest initiative is that we want to bring in a diversity, equity and inclusion director, which we'll call DEI quite often. Um, and this is really just to support us and give us board level authority on everything that we do to make sure that we are representative of our um, global community. So th to that extent, we want to say thank you to um, Trisha and Rupika, who've been um, leading the DEI committee over the past year or two. Um, now, the committee will still stay in place and all of our positions will still have committees that work with them. Um, and then the other change that we're going to make, or one of the other changes, is um, everything that you've already heard uh, that Amy has been working on, the community director responsibilities and the role were just getting bigger and bigger. So we think it makes sense to make those roles um, into a programs director and a membership director. And you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about both of those. Um, that adds two roles, and we're just going to um, get rid of one of the um, early career positions, as Sarah and Kuhu mentioned, and that will just leave um, one. OK, so what is a slate? Um, so you will have heard a lot about the, the slate process. The slate process was was new to me and some of us, but it's a it's a way of um, getting all nominations in at once. And I'll, I'll start with the, the first line, thank you to Wikipedia. A slate is a group of candidates that run in multi-seat or multi-position elections on a common platform. And that's the important thing. This is a, a common platform. Everyone who's applied, they are applying to represent and be part of and to help run the data visualization society. So we don't have any sort of conflicting interests in that sense. What we want to do, the, the big advantage of a slate and the, the reason we knew it was really going to help us in particular is in order to put forward one single candidate for each role and then vote on a collective board, um, that allows us to do everything in one vote, but it also means that we can um, really consider the makeup and diversity among the board as a whole. So thinking about our, uh, our reach as a global um, organization, thinking about the diversity of uh, demographics, um, and also just thinking about truly the, uh, the, the backgrounds of all the different candidates as well. So moving on, this is the nominations committee. Um, I'm going to, there's five of us here, I'm going to start with um, Kristen on the right. Kristen has been a huge help to us and she's a, a strategy coach and she has come in to be our, um, uh, our diversity consultant. Actually, uh, very helpful to me just to make sure that um, uh, in bringing up advertisements or the job roles or anything like that, that the wording is correct. The wording is not um, implying or precluding any particular gender or any particular ethnicity, anything like that, just, just to make sure that all the language is perfectly simple and inclusive and really just uh, make sure that we do everything we can. Um, so she's been certainly really useful in the, the early stages of setting all this up to me. Um, but the last time we met, I was delighted that um, that Kirsten said, hey, if ever you um, stopped doing this state of this thing, have you ever thought of working in HR? And as a um, nerdy British mathematician, that's probably the least likely thing I've ever thought of. So I take that as a compliment, but I'll also um, sort of explain how much um, help Kristen has been to us. Um, now, as for the rest, we've got myself, Alex, Matthew, and Senthil. You can see a little bit about them all there. Um, four of us from, um, from the US and the UK, so we cover a number of um, time zones. Uh, a number of different experiences as well. And all of us um, worked on the, uh, the nominations committee. Now it's important the nominations committee, which was um, it was set up by Elijah. It needs to have um, somebody on there who is on the board, but who is not going to be involved in the election process or is not going to stand again. Uh, so that was, that was myself. And then we have um, three others who were able to look at it objectively from um, at arm's length, who were able to, to help across all the whole process there. Have we move on? So um, quickly, you probably, well, you've seen most of the 2020 board by now. You can see from that, um, those that are staying on, so those that have no writing by them, uh, Molly, Julia, and Jason are staying on. The others are all um, uh, changing, if you like, either the member is outgoing or the roles have changed slightly. So let's um, see what's happened from there, move on. 
All right, so the applications process. Um, what we did, we started off, um, before we sent the, uh, the application forms out, we started off with the nominations process. Um, that was important. That allowed us to find out, to gauge interest in the roles, to let people know they were happening, but also um, to allow people to consider who might be a really good fit for the role, who might not otherwise step forward, who might not be checking their email and Slack, or who might um, not have thought of it without a bit of um, encouragement. So we allow people to nominate and say, hey, yeah, I think I'm going to be really interested in this role, but also to say, um, have you considered this person? I think they would also be really good. So. 94 nominations is really um, encouraging. Um, as we've mentioned there, we had um, eight roles to fill. And then once the application forms went out, we got 61 applications across those different roles. Um, there's quite a, um, I think there was somewhere between 15 and 20 for early career, um, and there were less for some of the other roles, but we had a pretty good spread um, not, uh, apart from that. So obviously we have some more popular than others, but as of that, we wanted to um, pick 20 people, but we chose 20 to shortlist for these eight positions. Now, it was important to interview people, obviously, rather than just sort of go on the application itself. And we wanted the interview to be face to face over Zoom. We wanted it to be um, to have two of the committee on each one, if possible. Um, and we also wanted to, to make sure that um, in, in the course of these interviews, we interviewed each role would have the same people interviewing. So if we were uh, interviewing person A for um, education, then if person B was going to be interviewed, we would have the same people interviewing as well. So we, we found some combinations of pairs that, that worked okay. Um, everybody has uh, was, was assigned two particular roles to, uh, to be the lead and then two particular roles to be the backup. And that way, most of us were involved in 10 interviews with um, 10 interviews, uh, sorry, yeah, most of us were involved in 10 interviews, either to lead or to be the backup. Um, now, every interview was recorded. So that means as well as being involved in all of them, we then also watched all of those that we weren't in. So we've all um, been involved in, in 20 interviews just to make sure that we got um, all the information we possibly could for every candidate. And then finally, um, obviously, we, we got back together. The, uh, we've mentioned the, the nominations slate, which means it wasn't just a matter of taking the box for who's best here, who's best here, who's best here. We took all our, our leading candidates and we um, determined what slate would be the best um, with our um, overriding aims of um, diversity and inclusion, obviously, sort of geographical spread as well. And we came up with um, seven positions. So. Um, let me show you the next slate. So here's the slate. So you, uh, you may have seen some of these. We've um, introduced them on the, the website and in our communications before now. Um, and we're, we're going to go through and I'm going to talk to you about each of them um, briefly after this. But we have Amanda and Amy, who you already know. Um, we have um, Kamudi Goma for diversity, equity and inclusion. Nola Dutoy for knowledge. Nina Untung for membership. Natalie Vladis for um, education. And Simran Pawani for early career. Now we should say the um, the remaining eighth role was communication. Uh, we we didn't we we weren't able to find a suitable candidate for for that role. So that is going to um, remain open, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that afterwards. And yes, as it says there, you can also see the the bios in full there at that link there. But if we go through onto um, the, to each one, um, we've tried to put a little bit about um, each person's aims and what they want to do. Um, so we'll start with Amanda. Um, but the last thing you want me to do is, is read that out uh, when it's in front of you. So if, if you want to sort of read through some of the great stuff that Amanda wants to do, I'm going to quickly sort of go through um, her bio here. Now, Amanda, um, it, it seems strange to, to read out the bio of someone we know so well, but she's a database leader who's worked with clients across federal, nonprofit, and private sectors for more than a decade. Um, so she's worked developing, teaching about and leading teams to create data viz across various countries and tech stacks. And as you know, she's our current um, operations director, but she's also um, the co-organizer for the data viz DC meetup. Um, uh, I didn't know this, Amanda has a BA in zoology and sociology, and she has a master's in public health as well, um, which is why you will have seen Amanda being so prominent um, and being involved in so many great initiatives over this year. You'll have seen um, Amanda being a real sort of um, leader in the industry of uh, um, critiquing COVID, and you'll have also 
seen Amanda um, involved in Chart Chat, for example. Uh, and we really think that all this and more is going to um, give a, a great um, position to be the role as executive director. Um, so let, let's move on. I hope you've got a chance to read that. Um, so next one, Amy. Um, and again, you can you can read about Amy's thoughts there. Um, Amy, as you must know, is a data viz designer and instructor uh, and co-founder. Um, and you probably know that uh, the innovative and unused data viz work, I'm a big fan of data viz, has actually won three Information is Beautiful awards. Um, so she specializes in working with subject matters on accessible and legible visualizations of complex data. Uh, and she has a master's in information visualization as well, and is an um, adjunct professor for data uh, analytics and visualization. Um, now, she's also a leader in use of style guidelines where she writes and speaks on the topic. But crucially, what Amy really does, she enjoys connecting people and creating spaces that facilitate these connections. Um, we know she's going to bring that joy and enthusiasm, but we've also seen the proof and what she's spoken about in the fireside chats, mentoring system, the buddy system, all these things which have been um, done in the past as part of the um, the community director, we're really confident they're going to make a, um, a fantastic programs director. And uh, next we have um, Cal Moody, and there's so much I could say. Um, she's co-founder of the Inclusive Leaders Institute and co-chair of the Keynote Women Speakers um, Directory. So she's a trusted business advisor, and she's basically a DEI expert, um, where she's helped transform organizations across APAC, EMEA, North America, and she's on the executive boards of various global organizations as a C-suite advisor as well. She has an LLM from the University of Virginia, Virginia and an MBA from the Indian School of Business. Um, and she's been recognized as Business APAC Influential Women Leader of 2020. An award-winning public speaker. I can't wait to hear more from her. I'm sure you can... Um, Agree, she's going to be a fantastic leader who's really going to help in all of our um, initiatives around DEI. Um, Kamid is originally from India, but she's based in um, Singapore. Okay, and the next one we have is Nola. Nola Dutoy is a um, senior research methodologist and um, data specialist at NORC at the University of Chicago. Um, and she likes to use methods of data and information, information visualization to support the research process. I will say that data means nothing if people cannot understand it. So Nola's passionate about the understanding and the detail, which, which gives her a really good fit to be a knowledge director. Um, she draws on one decade of experience in both quant and qual uh, search and uh, creates visuals and graphics, explore and illustrate concepts uh, and works in public health, education, economics and public opinion. Um, so it's very detailed focus uh, and understanding. My favorite part about um, Nola's application was that she wanted to actually get to know the board first before thinking, well, this is what we need to do across the board. This is what we need to do, uh, the, the system we need to bring in to organize because it's important to get that um, that personal experience. And Nola's originally from um, South Africa, um, but she's now based in Chicago. All right, and um, Nina. Nina is um, originally from Indonesia, but is now um, based in Austin, having studied at um, the University of Texas there. She's a, a digital visualization analyst at InfoTrust, um, and what she really loves is visual storytelling um, using data and images, uh, where she has extensive experience building organization analytic capabilities. Um, but you can tell that she's into the visual storytelling because she um, offers the services um, to, to local nonprofits as a volunteer photography. Um, so she's, she's a great um, experience with photography as well. Um, what really impressed us about um, Nina is that um, she successfully co-founded and ran a mentorship program while she was at, um, at university, which provided support system for Indonesian college students who were based in the US and set up a really good um, network to link them with um, local Indonesian uh, business professionals and has, has really helped that to, to, th to flourish while she was there. So she got some great experience of um, being involved in and growing and communicating with um, communities. So we, we really see she could be a great uh, membership director. All right, um, Natalie is next. Um, Natalie is from France originally. I think she has a Greek background too and is now um, based in the US. So Natalie has got a really sort of cosmopolitan um, experience, having taught on both sides of the Atlantic and having experience in the education system in, in many different countries. Um, she has a PhD in neuroscience, she's a lecturer in biomedical informatics um, and a curriculum fellow at Harvard Medical School. 
um, and she specializes in evidence-based educational practices um, to teach data analysts and visualization um, courses. And currently she, um, she, uh, she also loves to collaborate and lead workshops um, for kids of, and adults of all ages where participants have the chance to engage with data through craft and play. Um, we're asking all of our, um, our new folk to introduce themselves and Natalie has already given a great introduction in the Slack channel if you haven't seen that so you'll um, you'll see a little bit more about Natalie in her own words with um, with her plans and um, thoughts of what she wants to do in the role. And um, I'm aware I'm rattling through this but we've got so many um, exciting people to talk about. The next one is um, Simran Pawani. Um, now Simran is uh, based in Abu Dhabi so she's at the New York University of New York University, uh, University Abu Dhabi where she majors in interactive media and um, computer science. Um, she leads the data reporting and visualization team at her schools and independent publication um, but as we found out in the interview she doesn't just lead it she she set it up she asked for it to happen she um, she proactively came up with some great data journalism stories um, around her um, university uh, which were accepted and then just grew into an existing team that there is now. Um, she also serves as the president of a campus organization, supporting and empowering women and non-binary people who are interested in STEM. And so much of what um, uh, what Simran said and other things that she'd been involved in, all her passion came through, uh, particularly in representation of uh, women and non-binary people. So um, I think there's going to be all sorts of um, uh, of, of passion and enthusiasm for um, early career initiatives from um, from Simran. All right, so I, I hope that's just a, a little bit of information. As I say, you can go back and you can see all their bios on the um, the council page there as well. Sorry, and um, so this is what the board will look like. Um, well, you've just seen there what the page of what the board would look like. It's important just to say um, that leaves communications director vacant uh, because we didn't find a candidate. And also it leaves operations director vacant because Amanda has moved or will potentially, if the slate is approved, move from that particular position. Um, in terms of um, filling those, that's going to be up to the, um, uh, up to the board and us to determine uh, very shortly. So. Uh, do keep your eyes open for, for the new process. We'd really like uh, people to put themselves forward, um, particularly those perhaps from um, traditionally disadvantaged groups once more. If you if you really think that you um, would do a great job in either of those two, um, then we'd like to hear from you and we will be um, setting that process into, um, uh, we'll be setting that going very shortly. Okay, um, how do I vote? Um, Essentially, there's, there's a link you'll have seen in a couple of places. I put it in Slack. It went out in our email yesterday. Um, and there's a bit.ly for it there as well. We've just got a simple um, Google Forms, which is going to um, explain and give you links to um, all these people that we've seen and ask you whether you accept or reject the slate. Um, if you reject, you've got a, you, you can say if there's a particular um, reason for that or if there's people who you'd rather not see on there. Or if you accept it, then, then that's great too. You need to put your email address on. Um, the reason we ask for that is so that we can identify that we've got a valid person in DVS because obviously we don't want to accept um, the, the the votes from people who are not um, society members. But other than that, it's just, it's just be a very um, simple, quick process. Okay. And that's it from me. I'll hand you over to Amanda. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. And thank you for all the hard work the nominations committee has done. I know that it's been a tireless effort that's unfolded over the past month and a half and it's taken a lot of effort from the team. So huge kudos to everyone who's been working on that. I'm going to provide to wrap up a quick financial update uh, on our finances from the year. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone has some background and information about kind of where, where we get money, where we spend money. Um, this will be a highlights reel of our preliminary end of year reporting. We'll make a more complete financial report available on the website once that's been completed for our end of year review. So a couple quick fun facts, because data and numbers are fun. Uh, did you know that in the course of 2020, we paid $66,750 to our Nightingale contributors and editors, which means that not only has Nightingale been a really successful publication for sharing great data visualization information, but we've also been able to go ahead through our medium partnership and compensate our writers, editors, illustrators, and other contributors which I think is really speaks to the value that we place on covering people's time and costs, even if not at the rates we would love to be able to pay, but as a nonprofit, being able to do that is important to us. 
Uh, second, uh, we have allocated $300 honorariums for each speaker at the Outlier Conference. We thought it was important that speakers be compensated for their effort and for their time. And so we've added a $300 honorarium for each of our speakers. And over the course of the past year, two years, um, we've estimated that we've done around 100 plus hours a week of volunteer labor across the board and committees. And that doesn't even quantify the amount of effort and labor that went into special initiatives like Outlier and the Special Events Committee and into the Nominations Committee. So when you start quantifying that out, you're looking at, I mean, just with that baseline, 216 days of volunteer labor contributed to 2020 alone. And so if you're someone who does budgets and does things with hourly budgets and reporting, you can start to calculate out the value of that and the value of those volunteer contributions. So just to give you a sense of where we are in terms of where we started, where we ended, um, we started out the year with uh, just shy of $21,000. We ended the year with just over $31,000. And we have an additional $17,500 in outlier sponsorship money received with more sponsors who are sending their checks soon. So we're excited to have those outlier sponsor dollars coming in to cover the costs of the virtual event. While a virtual event may be less expensive than one that's in person, it still has a lot of costs and resources attached to hosting it well, which we heard all about from Molly earlier in this session. As we look at what that Delta looks like and looking at that $11,000 gain over the course of the year, we'll break that down in our financial reporting a bit more, but a big part of that is residual resources that we've gained from our medium partnership, which has been our primary source of income over the past year. So if you look at our primary income sources, we have our medium partnership that we've had now since July of 2019. That's been our primary source of income as an organization. We have not yet pursued a lot of grants or other operational funding. And we also have that augmented by the support given by many of you wonderful DBS members through our your Patreon contributions. If we zoomed in on that bar chart a little bit more, and if you just look at the big numbers at the top, you'll see that the Patreon, the Patreon contributions are a lot smaller in scale than what the overall contributions have been from Medium in terms of that partnership. And so as we go ahead and look forward, this is one of the reasons why we've sought out additional funding for Outlier, both through sponsorships and through event ticket sales. As Molly noted, if you cannot, because of any reason, um, feel like you can take on the cost of a ticket for Outlier, you can email us and we will add you for a free ticket. If you can pay the $49 rate, pay the $49 rate. We want to find ways to introduce ways to provide revenue to support the organization without making it burdensome to our members. And that will continue to be a value that we carry forward into the next year. Just for awareness, if we look at what we brought in from Medium versus what we spent, 29% of our Medium partnership dollars have actually been able to be reinvested in DDS activities. That's things like bringing on consultants where we needed them for specialized expertise and also for paying for software as a service type platforms and other things we use to run the organization. Those primary cost centers for us um, are really around a couple of key areas. So software and subscription fees in terms of what we use to go ahead and run our business, newsletters, contract signatures with things like DocuSign, accounting, streaming, um, paying contractors, that includes an events manager supporting the really heavy labor that goes into hosting a global conference with 20 hours a day of programming, um, bringing on Kristen as our DEI consultant for the nominations process in an effort to go ahead and address some of the gaps and challenges we've had around diversity and inclusion over the past year. Branding consultant for Outlier, an accountant to provide the support we need as a 501c3. And we expect that that specialized support will need to continue, if not amplify, over the course of the coming year and further. And so as we think about where our resources are being allocated, uh, we'll be working as a board, whether I'm in the operations role or the ED role. We'll be working as a board to finalize a budget for 2021 aligned to the vision, goals, and needs of our various new directors who are coming in. As noted before, uh, we had $66,750 that was paid out to Nightingale edit to our Nightingale editors and contributors. And so that's another big primary cost center, but notably it is not, it is one that pays for it itself um, and actually gives us excess revenue to reinvest in the organization. So looking forward, as we think about how we scale, how we continue to live this value about paying contributors for their labor in order to create a more inclusive data visualization society, we need to continue to focus on resources in 2021. Um, just for awareness, as your call to action as we wrap up this financial update, we are actively seeking operational funding partners, grants, other approaches to building a more sustainable base of resources. 
So if you are someone who works for an organization, knows someone at a foundation, or otherwise wants to support the growth of the data biz society and believes in the overall mission of the organization, we're always happy to have an exploratory conversation about if there are partnership opportunities that align to our charitable purpose and also would be a benefit to the organization who has some of these resources that they may want to invest. And we want to keep DBS as inclusive as we can. And this diverse range of revenue streams would really help. Looking back at the previous slides, those bars for medium were really, really large. So we have a large dependency on funding that came from that partnership, which has been incredible to launch over the course of the past year and a half of giving us some baseline resources to work from and a sustainable income stream. There is no time like the early months or years of an organization when having some sustainable revenue, whether it's from contributors on Patreon or it's with having partnerships like the one with Medium that enable us to go ahead and start to invest in some of our organizational resources and build ourselves out as an organization. But looking forward, we're really looking to diversify what those revenue streams look like. So do reach out if you have any ideas or suggestions for funding opportunities or partnerships. I'll also go ahead and throw up a thread on the Slack channel over on DVS AGM for any immediate questions about finances. And like I said, we'll be posting a complete 2020 end of year financial update on the website. With that, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to wrap us up for the day. I appreciate everyone who has gone ahead and borne with or shared with us as we went ahead and had some different technical difficulties. Uh, those can be pointed to me as someone who is new to managing a StreamYard broadcast. <laughs> so thank you for your patience as we do that. And as we do this, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hand over our closing words and closing remarks to our executive director, Elijah, our outgoing ED. It's been great to have Elijah on board over the course of the past two years, uh, amplifying the, the just recognition of the Data Visualization Society, sharing it with his communities, and being a big part of helping us grow as an organization in these first two years. So Elijah, who now has the fanciest title I've ever heard of as a Chief Visualization Officer, <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and wrap us up for the day in terms of wrapping up this first ever annual AGM and talking about what's coming in the future for the Data Visualization Society. Thank you so much, Amanda. So I'm the executive director, and you might have noticed that I didn't give an executive director report because my privilege of being the executive director is to take credit for everything that all of these people have done, not only the directors, but also the membership. It's uh, it's obviously not something that I'm responsible for, but I could just sit here and, and smile at the end and receive. And usually, if this were a live talk in person, this is that moment that I would take to pause and ask for everybody to um, applaud the efforts of all of our directors uh, for all the work that they've done. I think it's really important to reinforce uh, that slide that Amanda showed that said that we're doing 100 plus hours of work a week, volunteer effort. And I think that's an underestimate, frankly. The entire work that's gone into Data Biz Society, whether it's from directors or members, has been incredible. And it's been consistent. And it's the reason why we've had whatever success that we have. With that in mind, you can go to the next slide, Amanda. I think before we talk about the sort of data visualization society itself and where we're going and what we've achieved, I think it's important for us to look back to what the data viz community looked like before the data viz society was founded. I know it's hard to imagine because we just went through the longest year on record that anything happened before 2020. But even deeper into the past, into 2018 and 2017, if you were a data visualization practitioner, you didn't have that many options for engaging with your community and understanding what best practices were. Now, if you worked with a particular tool set like D3 or Tableau, you had a pretty good community around that tool to receive feedback and to interact with. And if you wanted, like I did, to write about data visualization, or to talk about data visualization. Again, if you worked with particular tools like ArcGIS, then you might have some capacity to write about it in, and get published. And you might have some capacity to engage with your community. But if you wanted to engage with the community more generally, you really had 
a constrained set of options. There were a few conferences like Tapestry and OpenVizConf that happened irregularly that tried to reach out to the broader community, tried to, syn to synthetically bring the community together. But these were small conferences that happened irregularly. And if you wanted to write about data visualization, well, if you were an academic, you had IEEE Viz, which is now referred to as Viz. But if you weren't, your only real option was to be like Nathan Yao or Edward Tufte and to develop a personal brand so you could write your blog and engage with folks there. The only real option you had to reach across the aisle and talk to various practitioners who were in different fields was Twitter. And as we all know, and I, as I have demonstrated time and again, Twitter is not necessarily the best place for healthy discourse about data visualization. So I think that when we think about the Data Visualization Society, which is now two years old, we have to think about what needs it fulfilled, what desires from the community, from the profession, and from the field that it was fulfilling in a way that attracted so many members and why it was so popular. And I think we need to revisit that and we need to think back to what was missing and think about now what is missing in this, in this modern day. You can go to the next slide, Amanda. And I think that as we sit here and celebrate the accomplishments of the Data Viz Society, it would be remiss on us to simply assume that we've done enough and that we can maintain the society in the way that it is and support our community in the way that they need. The Data Viz Society was never meant to replace the data visualization community. It was never meant to be the only professional organization for data visualization or the only avenue to develop and improve professional standards. And we want to continue with that ethic and reach out to communities, whether they're communities of practice or communities or more diverse communities, and make sure that we have an inclusionary spirit that brings people together so that we can lift each other up, so that we can identify how things are changing in data visualization, how our audiences are growing in sophistication and expectation, how the boundaries between audiences is becoming more and more ephemeral, and how our tools are evolving so that we have different capabilities and different approaches, and our professions are adapting to a world where data visualization is more and more prominent in everyone's lives. So I challenge our membership to think about the gaps as they exist now, to think about where D DVS has been successful and where it could be successful in addressing those gaps and supporting our members. Because 12 board members is not enough to produce the change and structure necessary to support our profession. We need the support of members. We need the support of other organizations. We need to work together. We can't be an island and we can't simply celebrate our wins. We have to also see where we need to grow individually and together. And the last slide, Amanda, please. And so I'd like to challenge all of you to think about how you can contribute to data visualization generally, and the Data Visualization Society, of course, specifically. And the ways that you can are, some of them are, are very low effort. For instance, you can subscribe to our various social media channels that you've heard about today. You can subscribe to Nightingale and, and share these the, the articles that we've developed and the talks that we have on YouTube. We're going to introduce paid membership. As you've seen throughout this, this talk, there's an enormous amount of work that's gone on in developing the Data Visualization Society. And I'd like to point out a key action that we've, that we've had in, in how we've tried to craft the Data Visualization Society. We've made sure to pay all of our writers for Nightingale. We've made sure to pay all of our speakers for Outlier. And yet, all of the work that's gone into developing the DVS beyond that has been entirely unpaid. And we need to acknowledge that while the, the term scrappy has been thrown around over and over again, while that scrappy approach was a great way to develop DVS these last two years, we need more formal mechanisms to 
continue to develop this organization and grow to support our community. And so paid membership is something that we're going to introduce and will help us to develop those, those revenue streams. I'd also ask that you think about ways that you could donate your time and volunteer for the various committees and moderation duties and other efforts that DVS has already introduced and will introduce. You can donate your expertise in helping folks through the mentorship program or through critiques. You can sponsor events and you can help to introduce us to your organizations that might be able to sponsor those events. You can help us identify and develop partnerships, which is incredibly important for us as we grow as an organization. Not just financial relationships, but partnerships with groups and with organizations that are also supporting data visualization and data visualization adjacent areas. And just generally help us to develop financial support so that we can make sure that moving forward the data visualization society is something that can last and that can be a resource for folks who are entering the field, folks who are trying to grow their skills, and folks who are trying to develop a professional field that is mature and thoughtful and responsible to its community. I'd like to thank everyone for spending the time to listen to this talk. I'd like to especially thank our membership for supporting us beyond the dreams that you know any of the founders had and I'm sure any of the board members had. And especially I'd like to thank all of our board members. They've put in an enormous amount of work behind the scenes, much of it that wasn't expressed here during this talk. And I really just hope that as a community, not just the organization, but the community itself, we can move forward and develop data visualization and hold that very dear responsibility to develop this idea of data visualization and literacy in the broader world and to not just make our profession something that is, that is stronger and more impactful, but make the entire practice more thoughtful and more equitable and challenging to, to our audiences. Thank you, everyone. So we'll go ahead and we'll wrap up the day by inviting some of our board members to join us back on the stream just to give a fond farewell um, as I add folks in here. Uh, it has been such a delight to have everyone joining us today and such a wonderful experience of getting to work with everyone over the course of the past two years. So we wanted to go ahead and give a quick thank you and farewell. Um, pointing to the banner at the bottom, continue conversation over on our Slack channel if you have any additional questions. <laughs> Please feel free to go ahead and ask those questions and make sure that you yeah. make sure that you uh, make sure that you have everything you need. Make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you want to stay up to date on the DVS happenings and other videos and content that we have. And with that, we'll do a fond farewell from all of our outgoing board members, continuing board members, and the folks who have helped to make DVS what it is over the course of the past year and a half. Thank you all for joining us today, and see you later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.